Welcome to video two of my antibiotic primer series. And in this video, what we're going to be looking at is amoxicillin and carmoxiclav. To make the, uh, the video a bit more realistic, we're going to be referring to a clinical scenario. And I'll refer to this throughout some of the other videos of a young child who's come to see you and they have an upper respiratory tract infection. So the child has got um, no past medical history of, of note. They've come to you with a productive cough. They've got a fever. When you listen, you think you can hear some crackles in the lungs. So you suspect upper respiratory tract infection, possibly in the beginnings of a community associated pneumonia. And you look on the guidelines and they'll tell you amoxicillin is the empiric antibiotic of choice. The question that we're gonna cover is why? Why is amoxicillin used and not something else? Along the way, we can think about amoxicillin and introduce coamoxiclav as well. Obviously, what I'm not going to talk about is dosage. You know, the, the dosing would, would depend on the, the weight of the child and the age of the child. Um, almost certainly, though, amoxicillin would be prescribed orally, and that makes sense because it's a community-associated pneumonia. When we're thinking about community-associated pneumonia, and in, in fact, this is true for many infections, we see a kind of an, an overlap of, of circles of activity. So we have in blue organisms that cause community associated pneumonia and also organisms that are covered, i.e. killed by the amoxicillin. And as you can see, the two don't overlap perfectly. And what it means is that when you prescribe the amoxicillin based on those guidelines, you're also going to be killing bacteria off that have nothing to do with this child's infection. But also, something that should be in the back of your mind is that when you prescribe that antibiotic, you're potentially missing out other organisms which could be the causative agent. What you're doing here, based on the history you're taking, based on the examinations you're making, is you're making your best guess and you're saying, I think that amoxicillin is likely to cover those most likely organisms somewhere in the middle here. And by the way, that's what feeds into the guidelines when they're written. Another way of looking at it is that there are other possible sources of infection or causes of infection that are not covered by the amoxicillin. Pragmatically, you would probably prescribe and then review. If the child doesn't get any better, at that point, you might consider that the agent was one of these things. Let's go back to our chart. This is a chart I introduced in video one. And let's look at this and we'll consider two questions which are kind of allow us to get behind some of the decision making about why amoxicillin is used. So we can look at it from two angles. What does amoxicillin work against and what are the most likely cause of agents for a community associated pneumonia? So starting with the gram positives, amoxicillin doesn't work particularly well against staphylococcus, both the MSSA and the MRSA versions of it. And the reason is that staph produces a beta-lactamase. That's an enzyme that deactivates the amoxicillin. It does work against streptococcus, both the group A strept and the pneumococcus. And this is good news because, as the name suggests, the pneumococcus is an important cause of upper respiratory tract infections. It also works against enterococcus. That's significant because as mentioned, we're probably gonna be giving this antibiotic orally because it's a community associated infection. And when we give it orally, that drug is gonna work against other bacteria, including enteric organisms. And that could explain why sometimes people report GI upset, so diarrhea, for example. What about the gram negatives? Well, the gram negatives, it won't work against the enteric gram negative rods. And that's because many of these things like E. coli have a beta lactamase as well. So they're able to detoxify effectively the antibiotic. With the respiratory organisms, though, and these are the ones which just from the name you might be looking at and thinking, OK, these are kind of also likely to be important here. Well, the good news is that it would work against many strains of Haemophilus influenzae. So that's good news. That's, that's what we want to happen. But it wouldn't be useful for Moraxella and Neisseria. To some degree, common sense comes in here as well. With Neisseria, for example, the two medically important species of Neisseria, gonorrhea and meningitidis. The child clearly doesn't have gonorrhea nor do they have meningitis. And so 
covering these organisms at this moment in time is not useful. What about Pseudomonas? Pseudomonas can cause respiratory tract infections, but here it really isn't pointing towards it. There's no kind of reason to think that it has that the child has a pseudomonas infection. And so empirically, you wouldn't need to cover it. The same also is true for atypical organisms. The child doesn't appear to have any of the symptoms of Legionella or any of these other organisms I've mentioned here. So, and that's good because amoxicillin just doesn't work against these things. This is also sometimes referred to as a cell wall active antibiotic. If the bacteria has no cell wall, clearly the drug isn't going to work. And what about the anaerobes? It works against some of the oral anaerobes, and that's significant from a community point of view because sometimes dentists prescribe amoxicillin for treating dental abscesses. It doesn't work in this case against some of the GI anaerobes. Let's look at it from a slightly different angle now, and let's look at it in terms of what are the most likely causative agents. Well, actually, in this case, they kind of overlap a little bit. The most likely agents are going to be pneumococcus and they're going to be haemophilus. There are other respiratory tract infections or infecting organisms here as well, but they're really unlikely at this moment in time to be causing an infection. So we don't need to worry about covering them. Remember that we want to, as much as possible, focus the antibiotic to just to kill those organisms that we think are the most likely causative agents. I mentioned this enzyme called the beta-lactamase. The beta-lactamase isn't encoded by every bacterium. Some have it, and what it allows them to do is hydrolyze this bond. So the red structure here is the beta-lactam ring, and the enzyme works to hydrolyze it, and in doing so, it inactivates the antibiotic. What we can do with amoxicillin is we can combine it with another drug, which is called clavulanic acid. So here, the structure on top is amoxicillin. This is the effectively the active portion of the antibiotic here. You can see the beta-lactam ring. And what's significant is that the drug underneath, the clavulanic acid, looks very similar to an antibiotic. It itself has no antibiotic action. What it does is it inhibits and decreases the function of the beta-lactamase enzyme. And together, what it means is that it allows previously untouchable organisms to be killed by amoxicillin, i.e. those bacteria that I mentioned that have a beta-lactamase enzyme can now be inhibited with the clavulanic acid. Let's go back to this chart. This chart now starts to make sense when we look at these things together. So these are the different organisms along the top. We can see amoxicillin with its quite focused spectrum of activity. So there's streptococcus. And we can also see lots of gaps, such as with the gram negatives. We introduce clavulanic acid, or here it's called clavulanate. And look, the box widened. Suddenly, we're now covering a massive range of other bacteria. That includes the gram negatives, Moraxella, Neisseria meningitidis, and others. Why didn't we just prescribe this to begin with? Again, it comes back to what do you think is the most likely cause of evasion? In a child with a community associated upper respiratory tract infection, do you need to be thinking about killing or covering E. coli or Klebsiella? or Proteus? The answer is no. So in that case, you can prescribe amoxicillin and focus the coverage back in. It's also worth saying that when we, when we broaden the spectrum, of the, with the, the spectrum of the activity of the antibiotic out, what we're also doing is we're not just killing these organisms which are medically important, we're also killing other commensal organisms. And that is a source of effectively collateral damage, which could affect the patient's gut microbiome. And we want to try to minimize that as possible. So here, amoxicillin has been prescribed because it kills the most likely cause of agents and leaves other stuff alone. And in the next video, we'll refer back to the same scenario and we'll kind of add in one or two complicating factors and focus on some other antibiotics.